Have you ever thought about what makes the stock market move up or down? I mean, really, like the mechanics of it. What actually makes the price of an asset like stocks move up or down? Now, the classic answer is just that there are more buyers than sellers, right? Or more sellers than buyers in the case of the market dropping. But this answer doesn't really hold up to any level of scrutiny because if you think about it, if I buy something, that means there's somebody selling it to me. So in reality, when something is moving up or down, there's always the exact same number of buyers and sellers because you can't have a buyer without also having a seller. Okay, you say that makes sense. There are always, in, in terms of how many transactions have actually taken place, yes, every buyer and seller have to be matched up to each other. There cannot be real, more real buyers or more real sellers because they you have to match them up against. You can't have somebody sell or buy something without somebody on the other other side of the trade. That makes sense. But when you get a wave of buyers or a wave of sellers, all of that selling or buying pressure will soak up all the volume on the other side. So let's say you have 10 sellers and seller number one is willing to sell right here. Seller number two isn't willing to sell unless they can get this much and so forth. Every seller has a higher price that they want for selling the asset. And so then when you have a wave of buyers come in, they soak up all of that selling pressure. And so all of the buying pressure coming in, they eat up all that volume. They buy it here, then they buy it here, then they buy it here. And ultimately as that happens, that drives the price up because now you've soaked up all of that selling pressure and now anybody who wants to buy it, there's nobody left willing to sell it at lower prices. And so they have to go to the next seller, which is somebody willing to sell at an even higher price. And so a wave of buyers can and soak up the uh, the selling pressure. But when that's happening, you might step back and say, hey, there's a lot of people buying this, which is driving this higher, so I want to make some money on it, but I don't want to have to spend all that money. I'm just going to make a bet that that will continue to happen. And so I'm going to buy what's called a derivative, like a call option that will let me play the upside without having to commit as much capital to this. Now, if you've been watching the financial news at all lately, you've likely seen that there are a lot of call buyers right now. And there are, historically, there are a lot more call buyers on the market right now than there are buyers of puts. And a put would be a bet that the market is going to fall. And so from a derivative standpoint, from an option standpoint, there's a lot more bullish sentiment in the market right now than there normally is. Now, when you take a step back again and realize what is the mechanics of buying and selling that actually drive prices higher, you need money coming into the actual asset to soak up the sales to push that price higher, right? But if enough people take a step back and say, hey, wait, I want to ride this wave up, but I don't want to commit all that capital, so I'm going to play a bet on it. I'm going to make a, a bet on it with a derivative, like an option, instead of actually buying the actual asset. If enough money does that, well, now you don't have any money actually buying the thing that's going up. And so now you take a step back and you say, hey, if something is going up enough, well, that might drive enough speculation to, to make bets using derivatives that there's no, no longer enough money actually going into buying the thing, which will make it go down. So what we're going to look at today is the answer to the question on whether or not call buying or buying derivatives, whether it's calls or puts, can actually drive something up or down. Can, can enough people buying calls change the direction or the magnitude of the actual underlying and, the, and how it moves? Let's dive in. Now, we already went over the mechanics. In order for something, let's just, this, this example works both ways, but just for simplicity's sake, we're gonna say something is going up, like the stock market right now. When you're just buying and selling the actual shares, that's fairly straightforward. Enough people coming in and buying will soak up all of the sale orders and uh, there won't be uh, any people left willing to sell it on, at lower prices. There will only be people willing to sell it at higher prices. And so you get enough money coming in to buy it. That's going to push the price up. Now, me as a speculator, I might want to make a bet on that trend continuing without having to allocate a ton of capital. So I might buy a call 
on the stock market. And theoretically, what this does is it removes my capital from the actual play. So I'm not pushing the stock market up with this. I'm just making a bet that the stock market will continue to go up, right? Well, kind of. At most of the time, that's true. Now, here's why. With options, just like with stocks, there has to be somebody on the other side of that trade. And at least for the initial trade, with options, just as with stocks, the person on the other side of the trade is not another trader or another investor. The person on the other side of the trade is a market maker. Now, you've heard me talk about market makers on this channel before and uh, why that uh, the, the, the aspect of using market makers to write your trades leads to uh, trading places like Robinhood be more expensive than trading at the larger firms, especially now that there's no commissions anywhere. But ultimately, when you buy or sell something, something, your initial transaction isn't with somebody else, it's with a market maker. A market maker's job is to make a market in any security. And so you might have one market maker that uh, makes a market in Apple. And so their job is to make sure that there's always a buy order standing and a sell order standing so that if anybody wants to sell, they can come and sell to the per to the side of their book that wants to buy. And if there's somebody that wants to buy, they can come buy from the side of their book that wants to sell. And since they're providing volume and liquidity to the market, they're, the way that they compensate themselves for that is by doing uh, by uh, creating a spread. So they're not buying and selling the shares at the exact same price because then they're not making money. So there's always going to on the big stocks, it's going to be you know maybe a half a cent or a one cent or a two cent spread. Uh, so it's going to be pretty tight. So on every trade that's happening, if you buy from them, you're going to be buying at the at the higher price, and then if you sell to them, you're going to be selling at the lower price. Now they're market makers, and so they're there to to make a market in the security, they're not there to hold a book or to hold a position on the security. Their, their job is to create volume and to make sure there's liquidity in the market. And so they don't want the risk of piling up massive amounts of shares or massive amounts of shorts on a security or on the stock market. And so what they do is as fast as they can, they unload that trade to somebody else. And so if you're buying and some, if person A is buying and person B is selling, they're going to match you two up with each other. So, you know, if you're selling, you know, hundred shares, hundred shares, they're going to match you up and they're going to take the difference. They're going to be a middleman between you basically. And so market makers do not build Build a book for the most part. What they do is they stay neutral because their job there is to make sure there's liquidity, to make sure that there's always somebody willing to buy or sell at, at some price uh, in, in any security. And on the like the penny stocks or on options where there's a lot less liquidity, you're going to see a much bigger spread. And the more, uh, the more interest there is in buying or selling something, the tighter that spread is because there's not just one market maker. There's there's a lot of market makers and so they compete for business. And so if I'm market maker number one and I have this big of a spread, but market maker two only has you know this big of a spread, I've got a 10 cent spread between bid and ask, they've got a two cent spread. Well, the individuals like you who are buying and selling are going to go, they're going to, you're going to get their orders because they've got a better offer for you than I do. And so there is competition between market makers, but generally if it's a less liquid asset, like a penny stock or a, or an option, that spread is going to be larger. Now, like I said, they unload their trades to maintain a neutral book because most of the time there is somebody to unload that trade to, but their job is to make a market. And so there's, especially in extreme environments, there's not always somebody to unload the other side of the trade to. And so sometimes market makers have to do uh, a, a little bit more creative things in order to stay neutral on their book if they don't have somebody else to unload the other that other side of that trade to. Now this happens especially with options because they're much less liquid and so there's not always somebody willing to take the other side of that trade. And so if you buy a call on SPY, the, the ETF that tracks the S&P 500, there is H in normal markets. There's uh, there's usually at spy options are pretty liquid. So there's usually going to be somebody who's trying to sell that call that the market maker can match that trade up to, but not always, especially not in times like this, where the amount of uh, calls being purchased are so much higher than normal. There's a lot more bullish sentiment. And so 
the market maker has got to make a market. And so they can't compensate themselves for all the risk that they're taking on by selling that call to you on just volume on spread alone. It's just not possible. And so they need to hedge themselves and they need to make sure that no matter what happens, that they stay neutral, but they just sold a call to you. So that means if the stock or if SPY in this case continues to go up, you win at, at a direct, it's a zero sum game that at a direct proportion to what I lose as the market maker, if I have to hold that short call on my book as you're holding it long. Now you're long a call, I'm short a call. I'm the market maker, you're the individual. If the stock goes up, you win. If the stock goes up, I lose. So what if I can't then uh, unload that side of the trade to somebody else who wants to be short. If I can't buy a call from somebody else who wants to be short so that I can match that trade up with somebody else. If I can't get myself neutral that way, the way that I'm going to get myself neutral is by buying shares of SPY. Now this is called Delta hedging. And so you don't really need to understand the mechanics of how many shares because it's dynamic. So if I've shorted calls because I'm taking the other side of a trade, I have to keep a certain number of shares long uh, in order to give myself a neutral Delta. And so that means if the option that I'm short will move at a 50% rate compared to the shares, well, I have to own half the shares as the contract represents. And it's dynamic because Delta changes. And so I'm going to be constantly buying more or, 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 or paring down on the number of SPY shares that I own in order to make those neutral moves to each other. But essentially, you don't need to understand the mechanics of Delta hedging. It's not really important to understand why it's important that they actually are doing it. You bought a call on SPY. I had to short that call on SPY, I had to sell it to you. That means for me to stay neutral, I have to buy shares of SPY. What drives the stock market or a stock higher? It's buying pressure coming in that's soaking up selling pressure. Now in a normal market, like we talked about before, there's usually the same number of bullish or bearish sentiment, especially with options trading. But in an environment like we have today, there's a lot more bullish sentiment and a lot more call buying going on than normal. This means that market makers are having to do a little bit more delta hedging than normal. And when they have to take the other side of a trade, when you're long a call and they're short a call, they have to buy shares of SPY. Buying shares of SPY makes them neutral, but it pushes the stock market up. And so there's right now a not insignificant volume of shares on stocks being purchased specifically due to Delta hedging and market makers having to take the other side of trades and maintain a neutral book because there's so much derivative buying going on. And so in a very real sense, it's, it's not the whole reason. Obviously there are a lot of other reasons going on why there's so much buying and who's doing the buying, but a good portion of it that contributes at least somewhat to the price action of stocks, especially right now, is when call buying gets uh, disproportionate to put buying or call selling or shorting, and uh, you have that uh, that big uh, that big skew leaning towards that bullish side. And the same thing, quite honestly, would happen in in the opposite circumstance if everything is down, everybody's buying puts, because then again, at the same the same thing, just the opposite, market makers would have to short the stock in in order to stay neutral on their books. Now, what practical application does this have for you as an investor, as a trader? Honestly, not much. I just kind of find it fascinating that uh, you can remove your money from the actual uh, buying and selling of the asset and make a bet on whether that asset will go up or down. And that action, if, every, if, if enough people are doing that same action, can still contribute to moving that up or down in aggregate. And so I just think that's a little bit fascinating. And it explains a little bit of the price action that we're seeing right now, uh, even though there's uh, uh, you know, with with the VIX being slightly elevated while the market is going up, lots of uh, uh, call buying driving up the prices of options, uh, contributing to uh, the market moving higher. Again, not the whole reason, but it does contribute. As always, if you like the video, I really appreciate if you hit the like button and the subscribe button. It really does help out the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.